In 2009, James Cameron released Avatar Into the World, quickly going on to be one of the best-selling movies of all time, with nearly $3 billion at the box office, also winning three Oscars, and also leading some weird hippie types to want to off themselves because he couldn't live on Pandora. It's meant to be part of a trilogy. Well, sorry, a pantology. You know, something like that. You know, something like that, guys. A sudden change of a series length definitely suggests the movie franchise was planned in full in advance. Right? Right? Cut to 13 years later and Avatar 2, The Way of Water, slides into cinema with all the grace of a boiled movement after a heavy night on the whiskey. To try and pretend to be a wee bit professional in this, I wanted to go back and re-watch Avatar before this came out, but two major issues popped up. The first being, I kind of forgot that it was coming out, which I don't think is a good sign for general public interest in this movie, you know, coming out 13 years after the original. The other one is, I just didn't want to. Avatar is over two and a half hours long, and my memory fits good enough. It was a solid movie for the time, but it had boring characters and was overly long with a lot of pointless scenes and a lot of spectacle that I'm not really overly interested in revisiting. I'm going to get this out of the way quickly. Good CGI doesn't make a good movie. When Avatar first came out, it was groundbreaking and people did cream themselves a wee bit too hard about it, but at least it looked good and it was very revolutionary for the time. Now though, it looks good, I guess, but lots of movies look good. CGI has pretty much hit its peak in a lot of ways, and I'm going to need a lot more than that when it comes to boring characters, boring story, and boring set pieces. To quickly sum up the original movie, humanity has screwed the pooch with Earth, overmining it, all that malarkey, so of course he comes to Pandora to mine something called Unobtainium, which is a super rare resource that's magic or something. Q a million references then to Pocahontas and Dances Wolves, and throw in a character called Jake Sully, who's the most generic person who's ever lived, who, after spending a couple weeks with the inhabitants of Pandora's moon, a race of, like, giant blue cat people and some dinosaurs, suddenly turns on all of the humans and murders them all, and then starts LARPing as a giant blue kitty instead. It's a really dumb movie, and no, they never mention Unobtainium again in this movie, you know, almost like James Cameron got upset that everyone laughed at him for over a decade ago, so he suddenly just dropped it entirely from the plot. Now we're ready for Avatar 2, where after, uh, I don't know, some amount of time has passed, probably like a decade, the humans are returned and they upset everything all over again. And instead of just bombing the planet from orbit because it gave them so much trouble last time, instead they land and they set up a full city, which you see about 32 seconds off in this full three-arm monstrosity. Also, for some reason, the angry kitties don't immediately rise up and push them back off the planet. Instead, they just seem to chill and that the humans built an entire city, as opposed to, like, the three buildings they built last time. Jake then goes on to lead a guerrilla war against the humans, or the Sky People, as he likes to call them. Look, it's lines like this that make me just see him as, like, a weirdo other kid LARPing, and also why I didn't like him in the first movie. Dude was a human, but spent about half a week as an avatar hanging around with some kitties, and then he starts talking about how the sky people came to our home. It is startlingly cringeworthy. Since the humans see Jake as such a threat, they decide to bring out their new secret weapon that is seemingly just built to face him. Stephen Lang, the guy who died in the last movie. Oh, but don't worry, they make a quick point that right before he went on the last mission, he quickly downloaded his memories into a USB stick to be sent back to Earth, by just randomly showing a recording of him saying it to the camera. Yep, yeah, the movie was definitely planned well ahead of time. Lang is now an avatar, and he leads a new project of marines turned into big blue cat people into the forest and... Wait, wait, am, I, am I reading the wiki for the first movie or something? No, it can't be that. It must just be a coincidence, guys. Just keep going. They go into the jungle like the first group did, encounter Pandoran wildlife like the first group did, but for some reason the Pandoran wildlife don't attack them this time because they're avatars, even though they attacked the avatars in the first movie. But also just by chance they bump into Jake's children and a little human boy who hangs out with them called Spider, who is Stephen Lang's son from the first movie, you know, the one who was never mentioned because this movie series was definitely planned in advance. The evil marine avatars then capture the children and wait so long for an airlift that Jake is somehow able to get there in time alongside his big mummy kitty GF who immediately kills half the marine avatars and saves all the kids except Lang's son who's taken. And you've already been introduced to the main driving force for the entire film. Not just that the humans and even their avatars provide exactly zero threat and challenge throughout the entire movie, you know, similar to the first movie, but also the kids being captured. There are three separate occasions where the kids are captured and held hostage, leading to one of the children, who they call both Talk and Doc throughout the movie, to claim this. And this is the direct quote. I can't believe I'm tied up again. A hint. Having a character point out your bad writing doesn't actually suddenly make it good writing. The children characters make up about 50% of the movie's runtime, and it feels like I'm watching a children's cartoon from the 70s. 
You know those ones where the heroes have some spunky kid characters around just to cause problems for them to get kidnapped repeatedly so the owls can run in and save them? To protect his children and the tribe, Jake decides that they need to leave the village behind and go and live with the reef people. And yes, of course that doesn't make any sense. His tribe are there with a group of humans who decide to stay behind with the kiddies, raging a full-blown guerrilla war against the humans and slaughtering them by the literal train load. But you know guys, he can't stay there because the enemies want to kill specifically him, so that means that people are in danger, even though they're in danger because they're currently waging a full guerrilla war against the humans. These rascally children that he's trying so hard to protect are... Talk slash talk. She's the youngest of the girls who's just there to be cute and to get kidnapped. That is in her entire character. The oldest boy, who is just there to look out for the younger boy who's a hothead. The younger boy who just exists to be a hothead and to cause things to happen in the story. And then the oldest girl. She is a messiah. No, seriously. Sigourney Weaver's avatar from the last movie is somehow still alive in the tube despite Sigourney Weaver dying. And suddenly the avatar in the tube got pregnant and gave birth. She has magic powers, she can communicate with the god of the world, she can control animals. She's also there to be an angsty teenager at times who's upset that she isn't like everyone else. And she like repeatedly tots and just rolls her eyes anytime anyone speaks. She was a real joy to watch. The family seek refuge with the reef people. And it's an amazingly contrived excuse just to have a fish out of water story again. And yes, that pun was kind of intended. It's just like the first movie all over again and that's the real issue. This is just the first movie all over again. Instead of it being Jake having to assimilate into a new tribe, it's now Jake and his family having to assimilate into a slightly different tribe to learn their customs and to fit in and learn to coexist with the animals of the day. Instead of it being like angry flying dinosaurs in the first one, it's now fish. The new tribe, of course, are all like racist and assholeish until Jake and his family prove themselves and then immediately their buddies until later on they need to have a quick fight, which is like forgotten even faster than the first movie. We get a scene of Stephen Lang going to the exact same spot where Jake learned to control the flying dinosaur creatures from the first movie, and the scene plays out basically the same as the first one. Instead of there being a big tree that everyone loves that's going to be destroyed, it's now a bunch of sentient whales who can talk. These whales are pretty much one of the worst things in the entire movie, because we're introduced immediately to one individual whale who apparently is an outcast from a species because he killed a bunch of his friends. Now, in this whale society, they outlaw killing anything... Well, like apart from the fish that they eat repeatedly. It's later revealed, though, that he is actually part of a whale and water kitty army that had tried to fight back against whalers, which then got slaughtered by a single hovercraft. So, somehow, people saw 20 dead whales and a whole bunch of dead sea kitties blown up by missiles and depth charges, shot to pieces with machine guns, and they assumed a whale did it and they banished him. Outstanding writing. This backstory kind of also ruins the final and really first combat sequence in the entire movie that takes place two and a half hours in. It's where there's an entire army of angry sea kitties and our heroes getting ready to face off against a single hovercraft where, of course, their kidnapped children are. The wheel then suddenly comes out and basically one-shots the hovercraft and its entire fleet of escorts because it's impervious to attacks because of its thick hide. You know... Despite that very same hovercraft killing an army in the flashback, including a bunch of whales. But suddenly they can't even scratch this whale. I can tell you, you know, an invincible giant killing machine really made for a tense battle. Even better when you had a marine biologist there on board one of the attack craft, for some reason. And he kept making quips and being smug about how they're finally losing and he's kind of happy that they're losing. You know, as hundreds of people are being killed in front of him. Which includes him like he's in literal danger the entire time but he's sitting there quipping about <laughs> yeah, who has the harpoon now it, 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 it was bizarre i'm honestly amazed though that this character just didn't turn around to the camera at one point and just complain about modern day wheeling because he was so close to it like a couple degrees and he would have been talking straight at the camera as he complains about wheeling the entire fight is i'm gonna be generous 15 minutes long where the kitties immediately swoop in once the whale has fucked everyone's shit up and instantly kill everyone with no issues whatsoever, saving the kids in the process. Yes, once again we have an anticlimactic final fight where the humans are basically no match for the kitties. I find the most engaging battle sequences are the ones where it's entirely one-sided with hundreds of deaths to one. You know, imagine if they remade Lord of the Rings and when Helm's Deep is being raided by the uruk the defenders just open the gates immediately and a fucking dragon pops out and blows up the entire uruk army in seconds. 
This is on par with that idea with how bullshit it is. But of course guys, just like the first movie, that can't be it. Because of course we need a showdown one-on-one -on -one between Kitty Lang and Kitty Jake. So of course the kids get kidnapped once again. And the army of 50 kitties that were just there mysteriously all vanished. So it's up to Jake and his family to save the kids. Which they have no trouble doing whatsoever. Because, okay, look. James Cameron clearly has a fetish for giant blue Catwoman. I know it's a meme from the first movie, people joked around about it a lot, but god damn it, this movie makes it so obvious. When Jake fights humans, he's shooting them with a gun or fighting people in downgraded robot suits that are basically the same height as him, even though those robot suits do nothing to help them. However, when Jake's angry mummy Kitty GF kills people, it's a lot more visceral, she's impaling people with arrows, looming over tiny men who barely reach her thighs, stabbing them with arrows, lifting them up to meow angrily in their face, having to shake their dead bodies off her weapons, like actually impales people and it's like shaking them, they're flopping around on her arrow. She is one step above just stepping on them or crushing them between her thighs. She's just an Amazonian goddess in a thong beating up short kings as water glistens on her fucking thighs. Mix that with how weird some of the shots are of the angsty teenage girl like stretching or standing in weird ways or lying on the ground like writhing on the ground in basically a thong or the long shots of her posing and swimming gracefully underwater. It really comes off as Cameron is just tugging one out to this. I've never seen a guy spend half a billion dollars to make a somehow shittier version of furry porn. And talking about the useless robot suits, which are just a weird downgrade from the original robot suits, which were kind of cool, but these ones like have like normal human-sized weapons and like have no protection, so I don't know why you'd use them instead of the old versions. But there seems to be no reason for the new marine avatars to exist at all. They die instantly. They provide no additional challenge to any of the characters and die just as fast as the short kings, who suspiciously are about 99.9% .9 angry white dudes. Now, I'm not going for the whole woke angle for this one. I'm only really mentioning this particular point because the only time I really noticed there being a non-white female was during the wheeling scene, where of course the main person harpooning wheels was an Asian lady. Look, it's probably a coincidence, but it just kind of made me laugh in the same way as The Last Jedi, having the Asian woman be the kamikaze in the bomber scene. The movie then ends with, well, Titanic. It's, it's Titanic. The family have to go on the sinking hovercraft to save the kids, easily killing all the guards, but then get stuck on it when it sinks, and we have to spend nearly as long with them trying to figure out how to get out of the sinking ships as we did with the entire earlier battle. And that's kind of a problem, because this movie does basically nothing new that the first one didn't, Except introduce that the kitties can hold their breath underwater for seemingly 10 minutes at a time, and that is a lowball figure. But here they are, panicking about being in the water, despite the entire movie being about them learning to swim and showing how they're great swimmers and can hold their breath for ages. It is the only new thing we are taught about the kitties, but the final conflict is them struggling to swim. It was so fucking distracting the entire time I was watching this scene. Uh, that's about it. One of the kids dies during the final battle, uh, where they announced that they were dying by saying, with a direct quote, Oh, I'm shot. I'll let you decide which one it is based on my descriptions earlier on. I think it should be fairly obvious which one dies. Stephen Lang also dies again, but also once again comes back to life, thanks to his son saving him at the last second. Like... The son and Stephen Lang's relationship is probably one of the better bits in this entire movie. And I was like, okay, I'm happy enough with this so far. Until the very last scene where Stephen Lang is thankful that his son saved his life, obviously. And finally calls him son, when he would just use his name. And he asks him to come with him instead of going back to the Sullies. The son then responds, once again with a direct quote. <coughs> and then jumps in the water. And that is the end of that storyline. I, I laughed. I laughed so loud in the middle of the cinema. I probably look like a dick. You suddenly find yourself sitting there going, three hours and 15 minutes have just passed, and nothing has changed in this universe. Stephen Lang is still alive. He's still hunting Jake Sully. One of their kids has died, but as like a kid, he had like a minute and a half of screen time. So honestly, who even gives a shit? And, uh, like, I don't know, a hovercraft was destroyed, and they learned how to ride a fish instead of riding a dinosaur. They, there you go. I really should have opened that as my summary of the entire movie. Uh, it, it's about them learning to ride a fish instead of a dinosaur. The end. 
I can't wait for the next two movies where they learn to ride, I don't know, a fucking mammal and uh, a frog. I don't know. We'll, 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 <laughs> it will hit up all the animal species that you could possibly have. That's going to be Avatar 3, 4, 5, 6, and whatever it fucking goes on to if this makes a billion dollars as well. I don't really like using the criticism of just going, oh, well, it's boring. But it, it kind of is. It's a slog to sit through. I summed that it was best I could, but that basically involved me cutting an hour and 15 minutes of content from the middle of the movie, where they just kind of hang out in the new village and learn about their customs, and then chat with some fish. It's 50% teenage drama about being accepted and being seen as a loser by your dad, and about 50%, well guys, this fish is pretty cool, am I right? With lots of scenes of them just swimming around underwater, looking at things. There is a scene at the start of them arriving in the village, where about about 5 minutes straight, they just swim, I guess. Alright, it's cool, it's good work, you spent a lot of money on CGI, mate, I'm so ungodly impressed. And I didn't even cover some of the silly plot points that are literally just there to advance the story. Like how a character suddenly gets a seizure that is never referenced again, and it is entirely so they have to radio the old tribe to fly a dropship full of medics over that immediately get told to leave as soon as they arrive, just so the enemy can track the dropship to where they are. Or despite them being at war with the kitties, they don't really seem interested in killing them. And instead they just kind of show up at their villages, burn their huts, laugh at them, and then leave again. Then do the whole surprise Pikachu face when the kitties get pissed and try and snoo snoo them to death. That's about four separate times in this movie where you have the bad guys pointing guns at the good guys and just don't shoot for seemingly no reason. Which doesn't do anything to help with how absolutely pathetic the humans are in this movie. I don't entirely know why the humans keep going up and bullying the kitties when every single time they piss them off enough, the kitties then just curb stomp them without breaking a sweat. Why wouldn't you just shoot first at this point? You're in a war. Why are you being so deliberately antagonistic and then surprised when you get the shit kicked out of you? I'm a character guy though, so if there's good characters, I could probably sit through a lot of them sitting around talking to fish, but there's nothing here. The main focuses are the hothead son and the messiah, who... Weirdly, I kept thinking it was called Kitty, but she's actually called Kitty. I don't know, I have kitties on the brain, I guess. The Hothead Son is just that, though. If you've watched a movie from the 90s, you understand him entirely as a character. And the Messiah Girl? She constantly whines that she hates being different, despite being in a family of six where five of them are like her, so only the mom is actually different. She constantly rolls her eyes like an angsty teenage girl every scene, and weirdly there's a scene where a marine is kidnapping her and calls her Buttercup, and she calls him Perv for calling her Buttercup. Isn't she like 12, 13? Did her parents teach her about toxic masculinity in their weird kitty culture where they're all naked with each other constantly? In conclusion, I can't really recommend this. I don't really know who I'd recommend it to. There's a surprising number of young children in the screening I was at, but I'd have thought the long stretches of boring content would be too much for them, but maybe the spectacle was enough for them. If you're into any form of action or combat though in your sci-fi, this really isn't for you, but if you are one of those hippies who somehow managed to survive the 13 years that it took for this to be made, I'm sure you'll love it because it is just the first movie over again. But that's the video, guys. I want to thank my Patreons for supporting my channel. As Wank Healy, I'm just saying, Samuel P. and absolutely massive. That's the video, guys. Bye-bye.